For this activity, I'm going to demonstrate or allow you to observe the isolation of DNA from an animal source. And in this case, we'll be working with dog testes. Now remember in this lab, we also have um, isolation procedures for getting DNA out of dried peas and is also a kiwi, which are plant sources. Now, in every DNA isolation procedure, you need some kind of a way of breaking open the cell, some disruption of the cell. Now obviously with plant cells, like kiwi and peas, remember, what, remember the anatomy of a plant cell versus an animal cell? They have a tough outer cell wall. So in those procedures, if you read in the lab manual, you're going to need a lot more physical force to break open the cell. In the case of peas, we use a blender. In the case of kiwi, we use some pretty harsh physical force of smashing, physically smashing the kiwi in the presence of homogenizing buffer. So that's a case of plants that we had you gotta break open the cells to release the DNA. Now, in the case of dog testes, we don't have a cell wall. Um, so simply, but we still need some kind of physical force to even break open the cell membrane to release the DNA into solution. Now, the whole purpose of DNA isolation is to, at the final end of the, of the procedure, you have DNA in its native form, or close to native form. Remember what that would look like into a cell. Do you think it's fragmented? you think it's in short pieces, or you think it's in long, continuous strands. Remember, we have three billion base pairs. So in our cells, in the native form, DNA is very long, slender fragments, extremely long. So the whole purpose of this test is in some way that we can actually isolate intact DNA at the end, okay? So how do we do that? Well, in this case, we're dog testes, and you can see here I have one out, and so a good source for dog testes is a local veterinarians who were always, they knew there were a lot of dogs, and so in fact, they would collect those testes, and you can see one here, this would be probably from a medium-sized dog, and that's what it would represent, okay? And this is our starting material for this procedure. Now, and surrounding the testis is a very thick connective tissue that really is not conducive to grinding, so we have to remove that first, and this is essentially a frozen, I like to work with a frozen testis. Um, the longer you keep tissue frozen, the more stable the, the DNA will be. Um, you don't want to, so basically what I want to do first is using a cutting board and a sharp scalpel is to remove some of that connective tissue around the outside, exposing the soft testis tissue. What I think I might want to do here is simply Cut this testis in half, showing you the inside. So this is all the seminiferous tubules inside the testes. You can see they're packed in. That's kind of a soft, pliable tissue, and that's the main source of our DNA. Remember, that's where the sperm is. Remember we talked about lab six, where the male gametes in animals are produced, and that will be here in the seminiferous tubules, so, so that's packed full of sperms, and that will be the main source of DNA for this isolation. So what I'm going to try to do here is simply carp, peel off the outer connective tissue the best I can. Of the, I don't, there, I just kind of shave away that the best I can. Um, trying to remove it. Up and we can just push it aside. Now, I essentially isolated this about the half of the testes I started with, which will be sufficient DNA for this experiment. So, what we want to try to do then is kind of dice this up the best you can, smaller pieces, and that's going to go into porcelain mortar and pestle, which is very handy for grinding up small amounts of tissue. Um, and this is a classic way of, of preparing powders and homogenizing tissue. So we can put that in there into the mortar and pestle. Okay. Now, what you want to do first, before you add any buffer to this, is simply smash and grind with the mortar and pestle, trying to just think about what we're doing here. We're, we're breaking open the tissue, and we might even be 
getting as many sperm cells out as possible, exposed out of that tissue, because that will be the source, the main source of our DNA. This experiment you can see it kind of turned to kind of a gooey like tissue down there in the bottom. And so we're breaking up, this is our physical force, breaking open the cells. Now, at this point, it's about time to add some homogenizing buffer. Now, if you look through the, in the lab manual, all the homogenizing buffers we use with different tissues all sort of like have the same components. You're all going to find a source of detergent in there. It could be very re refined detergent, like sodium dodecyl sulfate, or it can be a common detergent, like dishwashing soap. So you remember what the purpose of that dishwashing soap or detergent would be. Think about what we're trying to do here. Remember, where is the DNA in the cells? It's going to be housed in a, remember these are eukaryotic cells, so they're in membrane-bound organelle, the nucleus. So we have to disrupt and break open that membrane. So one way is using detergent. What do detergents do to membranes? What are membranes composed of? Remember that? I should remember that by now. It has a lipid bilayer, okay? And detergents are very good at destroying and breaking, solubilizing lipids in your membrane. So that's the whole purpose of it. I'm going to dispense oops, about 20 mils of my homogenizing buffer in a graduate cylinder. And what I prefer to do is I'm going to grind, continue grinding the tissue in this buffer, but I don't want to put it all in at one time. Usually I prefer to maybe put half of it in, maybe about 10 mLs. Okay, and we're gonna grind some more. So now we have detergent in there. And now we are disrupting all the membranes in the cell, including the outer plasma membrane, and the nuclear membranes, and any other membrane-bound organelles in the cell. Think about what some of those could be. We have endosomes, we have lysosomes, lots of things in here. We're destroying all of those. Everything is being broken up and released into the cell as we go about this just to get the DNA out of the nucleus. We're gonna grind for a while here. And, and the more I grind, the more DNA I'm releasing. Now there's a point where you can go too far. If you get too forceful with this physical disruption, you can actually damage the DNA. So there's a fine line between enough physical force and too much. So at this point, I probably released a, released a good portion of my DNA into the solution. Um, and I'm going to dispense whatever it, look at this solution here guys, this is really, put that into a tube. Now, I'm going to put the rest of the remaining of my solution in here. I like to rinse everything out to recover as much as we, we can. Okay, and we're going to put that over as well into here. So if you look at this solution now, this is the disrupted tissue and homogenizing buffer. Now at this point, we need to do an incubation. Um, and we're going to put this at 10 minutes at 65 degrees centigrade. And this is a water bath that's already been set. So I'm gonna take this solution, I'm gonna put it in here and close this up and we're gonna start a timer for 10 minutes. We're gonna heat it. Now, why are we heating the sample at 65 degrees. What's the purpose of the heating step in here? Everybody remember when we did the initial um, talk about isolation. There's going to be a heating step. What are we heating? It really is to reduce the activity of certain enzymes that would destroy the DNA during this process. Now, you think about in the cell, there's a lot of enzymes called DNA degrading enzymes called DNases um, that are normally housed inside Dr. Sermaz would say the, the lysosomes, it's one of her favorite organelles. And so when you break open those organelles and releasing all those enzymes, now the DNA is exposed. Normally it was compartmentalized and, it, and protected from those enzymes. Now under these conditions, they're exposed to those enzymes. So under high heating like this, it's going to reduce the activity or even inactivate those enzymes, um, protecting your DNA from being um, cleaved up into small fragments. So we're, we're, doing, we're doing the heating step now. Okay, 
Okay, when we left you, I, we were heating our sample at 65 degrees for 10 to 15 minutes. At the end of the heating process, that was sufficient to inactivate or um, inhibit the enzyme. So we protected our DNA during that step. Then we put it in an ice bath, and basically you're cooling it down to room temperature or even below. So now we have a cold sample with released DNA in it. So it's a picture of the DNA floating in this soluble solution here. We really can't visualize it yet because DNA is very soluble and buffer. So how are we gonna visualize our DNA in that sample? Well, we need to basically separate all the um, cellular debris from that sample, kind of clarify it a little bit. One of the easiest ways to clarify a sample is running it through either a coffee filter or in this case, four layers of cheesecloth. So basically simply by pouring this solution through a funnel with the cheesecloth on it, getting most of that material in there, we don't lose anything, it's good to the last drop. And I'm just gonna gather this cheesecloth together and wearing gloves, which is, gloves are pretty important at this point too because there's all those enzymes that could actually destroy your DNA are also in the presence of your hands. And so we gotta kinda protect our DNA even, even during this step. And it's also good to be working with animal tissue to wear gloves as well. But we're kinda wringing all that solution through. And we left the cell debris behind. And our DNA is now and this solution, you still can't see it. So our DNA is in there. So how are we gonna visualize our DNA? Well, we need to precipitate it out in the presence of ice cold, I just brought this out of the freezer, it's ice cold, 95% ethanol. Now, in the presence of ethanol and salt, because there was, we also had sodium chloride in our original homogenizing buffer, so there's salt in here as well. In the presence of cold ethanol and salt, the DNA becomes insoluble and it will precipitate out of solution. So I'm going to dispense about five mils of our DNA sample out of here. I think a pipe pet. It's kind of viscous material, so we're gonna get it up. Put, let's start, we'll put five mils in here. Run gently down to two. Again, you want to be kind of gentle with your DNA here because you don't want to be like petting too vigorously because you actually can break the DNA even during this step. Now, our DNA is in here. Now, basically, then, maybe it really isn't a rule of thumb, maybe a one and a half volume is about two to three mils of ethanol will be enough to precipitate the DNA out of that um, sample. So, in the pipette, the, the ethanol does have to be very cold at this point. So, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pipette three mils of ethanol. And this is kind of important. You tip the tube and let the ethanol essentially run down the side of the tube and kind of it overlayers the DNA sample. And at the interface of your, of the ethanol, you can see the layer of DNA sitting on top of, see that fluffy white material? that the DNA is precipitated out of the solution. Okay, so I'm pretty confident we have DNA at this point, but do we have intact DNA or do we have fragments? Remember, intact DNA is gonna be long strands, almost like yarn, right? And so the one way to test for that is then to attempt to spool your DNA around, I call these shepherd hooks. Okay, and these are very thin glass rod. And what you, this is called spooling. This is a final test here. So basically if we put this hook down in here and gently go back and squirrel. See, I'm essentially physically trying to wrap that DNA strand, which is essentially like yarn. 
around that pipe head. I put a hook in there at the, bottom, at the end, so when you pull it out, it stays on, all right? And here comes our blob of DNA. Now, if you can't spool it and it doesn't attach to this, then you probably have DNA fragments. So I'm reasonably confident most of the DNA that we isolated then is in a spoolable form in long strands. So I think we accomplished the task of getting DNA out of dog testes. Isn't that kind of cool? Look at that.